Welcome, welcome. I'm Carolyn Ward Bamford, and on behalf of the music division and my colleague, David Plylar, thank you so much for joining us for this pre concert talk. And we have uh, two distinguished guests with us here as well. First, um, Richard O'Neill, this evening's violist, one of the greatest violists of your generation. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> As many of you might know, he's a soloist, recitalist, and a member of the STEAM Takash String Quartet. Uh, yes, <laughs> we've had them here on our stage. Um, Richard has 10 solo albums with multiple platinum disc um, uh, awards. Platinum is a million copies. You have a Grammy, an Emmy, and in addition, and no less important, he's a teacher. And he's um, a musical and social ambassador to profits, nonprofits worldwide. And we are also joined by Jeremy Dank. The New York Times <laughs> has described him <laughs> as a pianist you want to hear no matter what he performs. <laughs> also, he's a New York Times bestselling author with his book, which you all should read. Uh, I can tell you that the music division staff has read. Um, every good boy does fine. He is, uh, <laughs> and many of you will understand that as well. Um, uh, also, he is a writer um, of essays, articles, and a libretto, in case you didn't know that. Um, he's uh, a, a MacArthur Genius uh, Fellowship awardee and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Both musicians are recipients of an Avery Fisher Award for their outstanding musicianship. And speaking of outstanding, we are joined tonight by yet another guest. That is a viola, an outstanding viola, <laughs> from uh, 1690 by Antonio Stradivari from Cremona. And that has been called one of the finest of the 10 in existence. And with that introduction, I will hand it over to my colleague, David. Well, thank you, Carolyn. Um, I was gonna try to do the bios, but I've only made it up to your first year at Oberlin, so I wouldn't have been able to get... <laughs> I'm pleased to see that you've made it past that, though, but I, that's good. But um, well, we're delighted to have you here. We've, it's been a great pleasure for us uh, to actually just sit in and listen to them rehearse. And uh, it gives us kind of a, a, I call it a bonus concert that we get as a perk of the job. But uh, one of the things that it, it brings up is, is an opportunity to talk about your experiences with these particular pieces, which I think fit together so nicely with a lot of the uh, almost uh, folkish kind of elements that kind of pervade each one in a different way. And so I wonder if we could just talk a bit about the different pieces, starting with the American Builder. Well, I'll kick this off with a with a Jeremy quote. I think when when I proposed the program, it's like, is this like the greatest hits of viola repertoire? In one? <laughs> <laughs> well, minus the cello stealing, but yeah, I think I think yes, the the, the American builder. I mean, uh, I don't want to talk too much, but you know, for for violists, I think often the the joke is, oh yeah, there's no repertoire for viola. There's plenty of repertoire. I think it's uh, and uh, and I think the American builder is is a very interesting late work of, of Schumann. Uh, he, I think the context is he he had a post in, in Dusseldorf as a sort of a, a conductor and it was, I think he was dissuaded by his friends saying this is probably not the, the, the thing for you and it turned out to be true. Like I think it really set him, set him off and he, he after this period I think he he d things didn't go particularly well. Um, uh, I think the the, the character pieces uh, are are very well suited for viola, and in an interesting way, uh, the the weaving of the lines between the viola and the piano is it's it's just done so so subtly and so beautifully that I I can even in today's this morning's dress rehearsal it's it's very enigmatic. It's uh, very ephemeral. It's it's almost like you're trying to catch these little drifts of clouds for these melodies, and and it's just an amazing work. I I might say that the focal point for me, not not that the other three movements, the prior three movements aren't great, but the last movement 
it's sort of a like a, a veiled farewell, like a lullaby. It's 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 devastating and kind of captures to me what Schumann that 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 magic that only he can attain. I mean, not to blather, but um, Schumann came on the scene as an incredibly imaginative, often very bizarre composer of fragments, right? His first piece, Papillon, uh, well, Abbe Variations is one thing, and then, then comes Papillon, which is just this little constellation of dances, right? And they so often stop in the middle, and they, he, he, he wrote these flashes of things, right? And he began to become, he tried to write big sonatas, right, big to be Beethoven or whatever, um, but his particular genius and the romantic spirit, you know, the way that he thought about harmony and ideas, it didn't seem to comfortably always fit, right, in a big sonata. And it, it, through his whole life, there's all this whole question of how to take these flashes of great inspiration and make them into pieces, you know what I mean? And some of the pieces feel like David's Bundler, which is such a wonderful dance suite, um, but for many audiences, it's too enigmatic to even take, even even now. It's, it's just too requires too much um, stream of consciousness, uh, free association. And these pieces have this beautiful kind of happy medium between, you know, not being not being long, beautifully proportioned little visions. But they, each of them has a kind of arc that that works perfectly. And and I, you know, the first one is this kind of classic melancholia of Schumann interlaced with these flashes of joy or lightness, but then back to the melancholia, right? And, and the second one is this wonderful kind of a hunting song or hunting, but I'm galloping, hunting, right, vision. Um, and then the third one is the nightmare, kind of, you know, the, the dark romantic nightmare. And then the fourth one is, a, we. Yeah, I, I wrote a whole blog about this that that uh, in the old days, you know, when they had time to spend like four days writing a <laughs> blog about, and I, one of the most beautiful things is there's this sort of sleep, this lullaby, sort of the sense of the parent and the child, but there's also this kind of mm, between lovers sleepiness, <laughs> quite different um, emotional energy, and he's able to switch back and forth between these in a way that's kind of amazing. So you're in this unbelievable blissful lullaby and then out comes this this feeling that is just irresistible and then back to within back within to the lullaby in a way um yeah i think that's one of his greatest pieces yeah yeah no thank you for that i the the um uh, just for those of you who don't know uh the library of congress actually has the holograph manuscripts of the american builder um purchased in 2014 and uh, some of it is on display in the other room, so you'll be able to see that tonight. Um, the next piece on the program, we'll talk about that a little bit, and then we'll take a, a quick aside with the, to look at the talk about the instrument a bit more as well. But um, you know, one of the one of the things that the, the Schumann references of these uh, has a certain folk tune or ballad uh, feel to the to the some of the uh, phrasing and, and things like that in the music. And then you have something kind of similar, but but also very different happening with Hindemith in this uh, in this uh, sonata, which comes from a remarkable set that has a whole bunch of sonatas, uh, several violin ones, a solo viola sonata, in addition to the the to the viola and piano sonata. Uh, so um, I, I think this is just one of those. Uh, you know, it's it's an I'd still call it like early Hindemith, but not like early early. But I mean, he was already already writing at a much earlier age, but. Uh, what, uh, what? Tell me about your approach to this piece, and, and, and I'm wondering how many people have experience with this piece, the Viola Sonata, um, Opus 11, Number Four. How many people know this sonata? Oh, wow, that's that's wild. A few people, yeah. <laughs> he knows yeah, it. You have to be quiet. <laughs> um, viol um, violists know yeah, it count so count well that they're just like yeah. violists can't count. Yeah, if, if, they don't count. <laughs> we don't count. <laughs> well, I. This this program, I, I not to 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 digress, but uh, the, I we sort of dreamed up a fantasy a program uh, about six years ago when I was shutting down my festival in South Korea, and Jeremy was so gracious. It was a hard time for me, and Jeremy wanted to be a, a really good friend, and we did this program. And w originally, what we started with was the chromatic fantasy and fugue, with Jeremy just w w walking out and just 
just starting the whole program with that, which I think is an amazing talk about a door opening. But then I think this this first movement, uh, first of all, for those of you that don't know it, it, it's through composed sonata. So the delineations between movements, it's kind of actually, I think even for people that know the piece, it's a little hard to tell. There's no um, scene changes or cuts. Um, but the first, the entrance to the piece is it's a fantasy. And it truly is one of the most f f fantastic sort of imaginative and very just beautiful colors. I think I can't imagine a more beautiful opening of a sonata. It's just really the sort of shades of shades of different hues of things you get as the, the melodies pass between the viol and the piano. And it's very almost uh, improvisatory. It's I mean, it has, you know, it will sound a little bit like Brahms, certainly the first couple bars, like, oh, I'm in a Brahms sonata. And it's, but then suddenly, oh, you're drifting into Scriabin a little bit, and the, the harmonies get more and more. You know, they, they start a little bit conventional, and they start to drift towards the 20th century, and then they keep coming back, you know, right? And that makes it feel like you're kind of at the edge of a historical moment in that movement, a little bit f fantasizing about... Yeah, this is this is a, yeah. the quartal the quartal Hindemith that we hear later. That's it's actually very very thirds <laughs> very thirds based. It's very, uh, but then then we get to the folk the folk song which starts the second movie. So for you'll hear the this sort of uh, a catharsis and then there's a very simple Volkslied that that permeates the rest of the second and third movement and basically from there it, it, he develops that. Um, and it, the the folk song is sort of in a mixed meter, so it it's kind of it has this nice little asymmetry, and uh, and it goes through quite a few different characters. I think it's there's some jovial characters. There's a very very bizarre uh, uh, variation, which which it has some marking plumpite. It's very very strange, and and I hope that's that's to me one of the, my favorite features of that piece. It's just so he really quite he does a lot in that work. I think I've played 17 Hindemith sonatas for different instruments. And when I was in grad school, I, you know, desperate for money, I would play for whatever. <laughs> the euphonium sonata and the trombone sonata and the tuba sonata I played a million times, yeah. So it was once you learn it, you know, just might as well play it, right? Um, so he got into a thing of writing a, what he called uh, furniture music, right? Music that people could use, right? It was practical, yeah? Um, and House music. Yeah. There's a little bit less... <laughs> Wasn't it called furniture music in German, I believe? Something like that, right? Yeah. He said, I think he referred to it. Anyway, he wanted practical music that every instrument could use. But this piece is not from that period. He was kind of a... It's a weird story because he was kind of a wild man as a young... He wrote that opera Sancta Susanna, which had the, you know, some very sexual things with the Christ and... I forget exactly, but it was scandalous. It was bad. Uh, and... Uh, and and he wrote and he was considered a very dissonant revolutionary. And this piece is n is not that. And then by the end of his life, he's quite um, in one. I don't want to say a rut, but in one style that that yeah. Anyway, um, I interrupted you. Sorry. No. At this point, he was more in the middle of the uh, <laughs> right style. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Was, wow. <laughs> um. You know, one one other thing about this uh, sonata that was when, when I was first looking at it, I mean, there, he makes such a big deal out of saying to the performers, "Do not make it make it clear that the second movement and the third movement go together. Make it so that like they have the audience has no idea mm -hmm. that there's this, you know, break at all." Mm -hmm. And then when I when I was getting to the third movement and, and reading through it and that the mixed meter thing, it just it wasn't notated in the score that at least I, I was using, mm -hmm. except that it said some uh, there's some. Uh, I can't remember some German uh, for Schiedene Tochter or something like that at the beginning of the, the that said oh it's going to be in different uh, uh, you know, meters throughout the, the right. rest of the movement. Yeah. And did that uh, was that was that something that you encountered that often or you know I'm just curious about it was just a, a odd thing to find. Uh, you mean the instructions or the yeah it was just the the way and, and just the the strangeness of, to me it was just. Uh, Interesting, given that there there was also an elision between the first and the second movement, right. but he was so keen on making it clear that those variations continue even though there's these new new elements that get sure. into the third movement and uh, right because the third movement starts with a what seems like a new theme and you think you're going to be in it, but then variations from the second movement keep interrupting. So the second and third movements are one 
kind of obsessive and continuous thing. Um, I mean, it is. You do expect German composers to write lots of instructions at the beginning. <laughs> um, maybe that one was a little obvious. It didn't really need to be written. Right. Let's admit that uh, because you could just say "go" uh, or "taka" or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess it feels very German romantic. This piece, right, in a way that he's accessing a lot of different styles and quite successfully, right? It's very eclectic, um, and and nonetheless, uh, maybe I'm just used to it, but it, it seems to work as a whole despite switching from one mode to another. I think one other thing that I, I'm this is just assuming as a given, but Hindemith was a as it was a very was a very powerful violist and uh, actually premiered the Walton Concerto uh, when Tertis uh, denied, uh, when Walton sent uh, the manuscript to Tertis, Tertis thought this is unplayable and sent it back by the next post. But Hindemith actually, I think, did the premiere, which I would think would be very strange to hear him Hindemith play the viola because we do have recordings of him playing Schwanendre. I think there's a mono recording of him playing Schwanendre with one mic for like 100 people. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of challenging, but uh, he does, I don't think he vibrates, right? Remember? I think he just, he doesn't vibrate. So to me, that sort of an interesting feature of that era that you would have this virtuoso violist that didn't actually uh, warm up the sound with the vibrato. But I think there's so many great viola works by Hindemith. I mean, I think this is... This is maybe one of the entry points, but I'm curious if, if you if you feel this at all about this piece. Just given the, especially the figuration of it, do you feel the, uh, an influence from Debussy or or a bit more of a French element there? I mean, I read that he was th you know into that, or he was playing uh, Debussy quart Debussy's quartet when you he heard that Debussy died, and so it was kind of on his mind at least in the period that he was writing this. But I don't know. The Debussy Quartet start, starts with a, a, basically the whole content is the DNA of the piece is stated at the very beginning in the quartet and it, it's, the, it's the entire, basically the entire DNA of the, all the movements. So I guess, yes, in some ways, right, would you think that, I guess well, there is some introduction of new material in the second movement, but. I mean, I, I, a lot of music of that period, Debussy was a big yeah, he was a big source of, oh, I want to do that, right? And it's a way to sort of avoid doing more Wagner in one way or another, right? <laughs> and it's also an incredibly compelling set of alternative harmonies, whole tone, and all kinds of things, pentatonic. And, 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 um, and, and so it's not unusual. It is un Hindemith is not usually this Debussy in your right, and he's not usually this um, lush. Uh, and it's... Well, it's wonderful, and for those of you who don't know the piece, you're going to be in for a real treat. It's a, it's a really wonderful piece. Let's talk a little bit about the viola. We all know Antonio Stradivari was from Cremona, and also from Cremona was the Marquis Ariberti, and he uh, knew Stradivari, and he commissioned two violins and a cello from him, which he then presented to the Grand Prince Ferdinando de' Medici. And Ferdinando loved this trio, the two violins and the cello, so much that he then commissioned two violas from Stradivari as well to make a quintet. Um, one of the violas was a tenor and one was a contralto. One was larger, one was smaller. The uh, viola that you'll hear tonight on the program with Richard is the contralto, the smaller, from 1690. Um, and so, the, the thing that's really fascinating to me about that commission of two violas is that um, last week, uh, 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 Jason Price wrote an article on violas, and he looked at the output, output and production of um, violas by Stradivari, and only 1% of his production was violas. So by commissioning two, that added quite a bit to the number. <laughs> um, and as a matter of fact, we have um, the one on loan to us from the Tuscan Corporation, the one that Richard is playing, and we also have one here at the Library of Congress. So it's remarkable when you think about that in terms of um, we know about all the violins and the cellos, and here is the number for the violas. In any event, that particular viola, or our viola for this evening, left 
um, Italy at some point. We know that by 1793 it was up for auction, and by 1803 it was in London with the Betts dealers. Um, we have a violin here, some of you may know, in the Whittall collection called the Betts Stradivari from 1704. It's that same name from the same shop. The viola, this evening's viola, stayed in England for a very long time and passed ownership, and eventually it came to the United States in 1924. So think about that. It was made in 1690, and it finally reached the United States in 1924 when it was bought by Herbert Strauss from the Macy's department store family. He played viola. Um, after that, in 1957, Cameron Baird bought the viola, and he was from Buffalo, New York. and. Um, he had been a piano player, he played the viola, he studied composition and conducting in Berlin. He was quite, quite active in the musical scene in Buffalo, New York, and actually contributed to the founding of um, the, the, the music department um, at the University of Buffalo. He was chairman there he, um, with the uh, oratorio chorus in Buffalo. And um, so really very active, and um, after he died, it passed, the viola passed to the Tuscan Corporation, who then uh, eventually put it on loan with the Library of Congress in 1977, and I should say that is an incredibly generous loan, um, as you will hear tonight. Um, let's see, what else can I say before you get to talk? Um, ah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to say one thing though um, about the viola that um, it has been played by the world's leading violas and by string quartet players when they come here on our stage, um, they borrow it. It's also been played by many young professionals. It's been played by Sammy Rhodes of the Juilliard. It's been played by the Budapest String Quartet. It's been played by Who's on my list here? Ah, Pincha Zuckerman, Roberto Diaz, Richard O'Neill, and Miles Hoffman. Um, it's been on exhibit. It was first on the exhibit in the 1855 loan exhibit at South Kensington. A hundred years later, it was on exhibit in Cremona. And it's been featured in books, articles, magazines. It has a poster. It actually has a Grammy Award. We, uh, we uh, commissioned a piece in 2015 for its 325th birthday. And that piece by Jennifer Higdon did win a Grammy. It was premiered by Roberto Diaz. And you can see some of that in our foyer display. Um, so I'm thinking that it needs an Emmy to go with your Grammy and Emmy. So we need a film on it now. So if anyone has any ideas, that's... Uh, <laughs> the red viola. Um. Yeah. <laughs> the red viola. <laughs> Well, but thank you for doing the transcription, and uh, now you can. Oh well, well, um, you know, I, I I'm in a quartet with Sammy Rhodes's daughter Harumi, so she's like my sister, and and Sam Sam came to a concert once, and and I had just found out that this was going to happen, and he said, Richard, that is my favorite viola ever, and Sam has a beautiful Zanetto viola. I don't know if you you guys have heard it, but he he has this beautiful beautiful. Zanetto and he's plays so beautifully. And I think of Sam with that sound, but he said, I love that viola. You're gonna it's just the best viola. Um I I could we could spend the next recital hour talking about violas, but one one nice thing about this this viola, besides that it's in, in pristine condition, but it's it's of proportions that are quite um negotiable. It's not a large viola. Um I think the arching gives it this sort of um, body and depth of the sound, which s makes it sound, how to say this, less like a violin and more like a viola, um, meaning that it has just a little bit more, uh, it's a plusher sound, but it's it has all the hallmarks of why we know strads are just so amazing. I mean, it just has this true, <laughs> amazing, I don't know, the, I recorded it, you know, in the vault when we were, I was practicing on it, and it just has just every pitch dead center. If you if you play if you play in tune, that's the that's the rub. But um, it it just rings in such a way. It's really really phenomenal. And after getting to talk with the daughter of Cameron and and hearing that he loved Bach so so much, and that he played Bach, and to think that uh, that you know it's, this is what are we doing? This is all a continuum, and we're just so lucky to be be here. 
and I'm so lucky to be able to to play play a few notes on it this evening and honor your father and and you guys can all hear it. I mean, I wish you could everybody every day you could hear it. You can hear Roberto's recording of the Higdon. It's just phenomenal and and it's so great that it's it's it, it's living. I think it gets quite a bit of use. Sometimes you do worry with these instruments that are in collections that that sometimes that they they don't they don't get love and they sit away and they don't they but I think it's been getting a lot of love at least the way I've been how it's been feeling it's not it's been cared for and and played and it's and the Bach I think the Bach speaks for itself I really don't mean to say why I stole it or how great it is so <laughs> well thank you so much I mean the uh, we, you know, it would be great to talk about, we, first we had Hidemit as uh, a major composer violist, and then we have Rebecca Clark. And I, we're extremely excited that you're performing her sonata, her viola sonata, written in the same year as Hindemith's sonata. And um, uh, we we have that manuscript, and we're actually going to be getting uh, Rebecca Clark's uh, uh, more papers uh, related to her. Um, I believe the first tranche is coming in. I'm not totally sure exactly when that's all going to be settled, but it, it looks like that's happening. And uh, so we're very excited about that as well at the library. And um, in, in, a, in a way, this get, it, it fits so interestingly with the Hindemith to hear them next to each other. And so uh, I'd love to just hear your thoughts on it. It's just such a wonderful piece. And it, we're I mean, I, I adore this piece. And I, I was forced by many violists to play it over when I was a student, you know. And, but from the, from the, from the very beginning, I, I felt that this piece has some kind of life energy that's uh, very unusual and some, some really, I hate to use this word, some really kick-ass harmonies, yeah? There's a, there's a passage at the beginning of the last movement where the piano begins playing this lonely tune, right? Just kind of Asian-ish, right? Maybe an English folk song, maybe, but it's there in this sort of, and you just hear the notes of the melody, no harmonies. And then the viola comes in and suddenly this same tune is kind of draped and devoured by late Western romantic harmony, the most delicious you know, and kind of deep, decadent, right? Sounds, and there's this incredible contrast she sets up of these things. She's able to do that. The unfolding of the last movement from the slow tune through the through the various you know changes through the scriabin and then back to the and then and then there's this astounding passage too where the piano the viola is and the pia and the the piano just plays the tune again incredibly quietly, right? and gradually builds to this outrageous climax of return. I think that's incredibly ingenious um, and ravishingly well-written for both instruments, you know. Um, the second movement's full of wit and charm and textural elegance, right, and, and um, and and then overall incredible tunes, right? There's a l you'll hear a lot of Debussy in it, I think, right? Um, you hear that world, the Bloch Suite, which famously won the competition that she entered. She was robbed, you know, of, of, of this famous competition in 1919 where Ernst Bloch Suite won because the tie-breaking vote was cast by a friend of Ernst Bloch. Um, it was Elizabeth uh, Sprague. But it was mine. Yeah. It was, no, it was I mean, her. I know. Still, I know. still, still. Um, this is a great, you know, grievance of music history that we're still dealing with. Um, um, because this piece has is obviously a huge, huge talent. Yeah, um. I think one of the, the the you know the hall you're all going to enter. We all know it's the Coolidge Auditorium. But if it wasn't for her and her competition, I mean, you just have to look at some of the repertoire that we have, and it, it's just phenomenal what she was able to achieve, what she added to uh, Appalachian Spring, Bartok Five. It's just. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whoa! So, uh, but this this was sort of the beginning, right? This this nineteen nineteen competition because I think Miss Coolidge was starting what would become Tanglewood, and she had a little convo with Miss Clark saying, you know, I'm going to do this competition, and so I think you should enter. And so she she was a very enterprising violist, so she she traveled across to Los Angeles flew to Hawaii, played a whole bunch of concerts, steamered back to Vancouver, and then went across Canada and in Detroit. So this basically the sonata was written 
all over the place from Los Angeles to Honolulu to Detroit. So it has a lot of interesting elements. But I think when it did enter the competition, I think a lot, I think it, the rules are like never have an even number jury. Um, but but it was split down the yeah, middle, yeah. and then Miss Coolidge did uh, cast a tie for Ernest Block, which is is another phenomenal, uh, a great piece, too. really great piece. But I think it, like I think it's kind of amazing. She she used the piece in her during her career to not only promote the viola, but her also herself. I mean, she was a very enterprising lady, gorgeous, and and her playing was beautiful. And it's it's really, I think. Un I, I would argue as a violist, unlike maybe the other repertoire on the program, which is equally amazing in its own ways, um, it's idiomatically very well written for the viola. She really exploits every possibility of the instrument because she played the instrument. And it's, it's fun to have a, a piece that's written by somebody that understands what, what, um, what can be done um, at the, all, all the extremes and all... Also, the compositional elements in the, in the piece are pretty um, amazing. It's hot. It's hot. I mean, and, and can I say the poem for a second? Oh, no. At the beginning, <laughs> there's a, a request from the competition. There's a little bit of poem at the beginning, um, and I often say it in concert, but sometimes I get too embarrassed to do it because because you kind of have to go directly from the poem into the piece for it to get maximum. It says, "Poet, take up your lute. The wine of youth ferments tonight in the veins of." God, and then boom, wah, but on the piece, goes, you know, and, and it has this, you know, um, quality of like, you know, really just pouncing upon you with full romantic fervor, right? Yeah, um, which I love, which I love. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's sort of a declamatory opening, isn't it? It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, to say the least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one last thing I should say about Rebecca Clark. Um, we should never stop saying things about Rebecca Clark. She's wonderful. Um, but she, another thing that I should mention is that Mrs. Coolidge eventually, she, she entered her piano trio, uh, the next competition, which I don't think was, I think it was a 21. And then in 23, Mrs. Coolidge uh, commissioned her and she wrote this wonderful rhapsody for uh, cello and piano, um, which doesn't, as far as I know, doesn't really get played that much, but it's a really wonderful piece. It's just a bit on the longish side for a solo um, I think it's 20, 25 minutes or something like that. But it's really wonderful and worth checking out for sure. But it also has this sort of oratory to it. Uh, that's that's just a wonderful thing. So, um, But in any case, I know we are uh, running out of time. But I, so I wanted to see if there might be something that uh, you'd like to tell us about uh, upcoming projects or things like that that, that you'd like to just to listen back? to. Our upcoming project is to play well for you tonight. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's sufficient. That's the most imminent project that we have. Yeah. I do think, yeah, if, if you haven't read Jeremy's book, it's, it's phenomenal. And yes, I would say that's, that's really... It does have an account of my brief, lamentable viola career also. Um, yes. Right, and, yes. and so, I mean, I, I was going to ask you that. So you did play the viola, you have that in common, but how did you two meet and collaborate? Uh, we met first at the Marlboro Music Festival, right, or uh, whatever it's called, music school, music, whatever it is, um, and festival. And, festival. and uh, did we play together that first summer? Yeah. No. How old were you then? I was just asking that. Oh, I shouldn't ask you that. Okay, never 16. mind. Sixteen. <laughs> no. um, and then we 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 uh, we have a very close mutual friend named Fred Sherry, and then we 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 worked on this piece by uh, Schoenberg, the Ode to Napoleon, and we recorded it. And I had never thought that I would love Schoenberg so much, but Jeremy just kicked ass on it so much. It was that so was great. an amazing project because we were spending Stravinsky's money on recording Schoenberg. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I loved that. Oh, it's very yeah, true. We're just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. So Jeremy, yes, we've we there there was a music festival. There is a music festival in Seattle called the Seattle Chamber Music Festival, and the artistic director there uh, was a lady named Toby Sachs, and she was she was like a mom to a lot of us. And Jeremy and I w spent many many summers, like weeks upon weeks, there, yeah, playing that's true. Yeah. ultra uber romantic like 19th century <laughs> piano quintet. To Toby liked uh, undervalued late 19th century romantic. Blowouts, right? Barn burners, you know, Excellent. and with tons of you know, piano, and the strings are like soaring with big tunes, and then we did a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. 
I should go move my fingers, I think. I, yeah. I guess so. Well, please join me in thanking our guests. For-